sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I think you're in for a very interesting uh, presentation from uh, Mark Horowitz. Allow me to uh, introduce him. Um, Mark is a uh, Mark is a managing director and a portfolio manager at J.P. Morgan Wealth Management. He has been ranked by Forbes consistently as a best in state financial advisor for the last four years. He has served as an adjunct professor at the NYU School of Business in the areas of behavioral finance and economics, and which actually is the uh, basis for today's presentation. I know for a fact Mark has written some books on the topic. In addition to all of that, Mark is also one of the lead financial advisors for Jewish National Fund's uh, assets. So I turn the program to Mark, introduce him. Uh, I think you're going to be in for a very interesting presentation. Mark, it's all yours. And you're muted. I just got muted. Okay, you now go. I'm unmuted. You're unmuted. Excellent. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope we'll have some fun. So the basis for this presentation began in 2008 um, when I watched the world go to pot, and I watched otherwise rational, sensible people do what they always do during market turbulence, the very worst thing, and capitulate and sell out of the market. And this has historically been the case and historically why people find stock investing so frustrating. And I decided that it, it was time for me to add a new um, educational repertoire to what I already knew in finance. And I started reading and studying everything there was to know about what we call behavioral finance, which is the psychology behind money. Um, lo and behold, I did a presentation once at a seminar and there was a somebody from the faculty of NYU was there came up to me and said gee whiz would you teach this at NYU and I said me a college professor he said absolutely well there I was starting to teach this in college and it was a lot of fun um, and over the years I've developed a deeper and deeper understanding of the relationship between psychology and decisions that revolve around money so uh, it's not working anymore. Hold on. My, there we go. <clears throat> okay. So this is about investment success. 90% of investment success entails putting in place a prudent investment strategy and then leaving it alone. The more you patch go with your portfolio, the more you try to be smarter the likelihood that you're going to underperform only increases. So this is my expression, which is that investing would be a lot of fun, very enjoyable, extremely rewarding, if only we weren't so human. It is the human nature to try to do something to alleviate whatever is going on. So we swing the pendulum between greed and fear and we like to jump into hot markets and we like to jump out of markets that go down. That is a basic human nature. The more human we are, the likelihood that we will be successful at investing only goes down. <clears throat> so what I did for this presentation was sit back and think about some of the things that I've heard from clients over the years. Um, if some of these sound ridiculous to you, it's not because I'm trying to insult your intelligence. I'm just trying to give you the gamut of the types of things that I have heard from otherwise very intelligent, very smart people. Some of these I've heard from CEOs of public companies. Some of these I've heard, believe it or not, from people that are investment professionals um, who don't really understand how wrong they were in what they were saying at the time. <clears throat> so let me just go through them quickly on the bullet points and then we're gonna go through each one and we're going to understand where these things come from and why they're not true. Number one, this is definitely not the time to invest. The market is at an all time high. Everybody can relate to that one right now. <clears throat> you may have left the market. 
you may be sitting on cash from a um, an liquidity event. <clears throat> you're looking at the market, you're looking at where it is, you're looking at where it's been historically, and you're thinking, I'd have to be out of my mind to get into the market right now. Or <clears throat> I'm getting out of the market. It's too expensive. Everybody knows, quote, there's going to be a correction. I'd like to meet everybody because I've never met this person named everybody who knows everything, but there's somebody named everybody who knows that there's going to be a correction. On a prior call with Matt, we heard from somebody who said that somebody who's very smart said that in 18 months from now, they didn't, they didn't say 18 months, three days and four hours, the market's going to bottom. That's a very interesting prediction. I put it on my calendar and in 18 months, we're not going to give Matt a call and we'll see if they were right. So some people think they can get out of the market, sit tight and wait for a correction and then go back in. Why would I pay $400 for one share of ABC stock when I can buy a dozen shares of XYZ? Um, I've heard this so many times, it's really unbelievable. People look at the stock price and they make a decision based on the dollar value, whether or not they should buy the stock, whether or not it's expensive. Um, I'm holding on to the stock until I break even. <clears throat> you buy a stock, it goes down and you just sit with it because you're gonna break even. And when you break even, you convince yourself that you're going to sell it and buy something else. Sounds pretty logical. Why should I sell it at a loss? This stock is a great buy. It was only 20% higher. It was 20% higher only a month ago, right? This stock was 20% higher. So it has to be a buy because it's on sale. It's like a dress. It's 20% off. It's a bargain. What can go wrong with that? <clears throat> Please buy me a thousand shares of XYZ. My nephew just became their CFO. Twice in my career have I gotten such a phone call from a client who no, just was absolutely convinced that because their nephew became the CFO of a company, it's a reason to buy their stock. Both times it did not work out as planned. And the last one, I like to keep lots of cash in the bank. It helps me sleep at night. <clears throat> Everybody can relate to that opening up your checking account or your savings account and seeing a vast amount of cash there gives us a certain degree of comfort. Okay, let's jump right in. <clears throat> this is not the time to invest. The market is at an all time high. Let me see if I can move this so I can actually see. There we go. <clears throat> so you wouldn't be surprised to know that there were 32 new highs made in 2020 alone. So the market started 2020 at one point that ended 17 and percent higher and to climb to that 17 and percent, it made 32 new highs. The market has made countless new highs as it grew and climbed from when it began way back in the 1800s to where it is today. All time highs will always be reached before the market goes even higher. That's completely normal. When something is climbing, it will be making new time, all time highs. In other words, the price of the market is only part of the story. In other words, where the market is and what the price of the market is, is for a, to a great degree irrelevant. If the Dow is at 22,000, 23,000 or 17,000, it actually tells you almost nothing. You have to look under the hood and you have to see what the market's comprised of. You have to understand all of the variables that drive the market, such as what earnings are being forecasted to the market. What does current earnings look like relative to price? What is inflation? What are prevailing interest rates? So what does the competition look like? So looking at the market and even looking at the market multiple in isolation doesn't give you enough information whether or not you should be buying or selling the market. So what I encourage people to do is what's in green. What you should do is take a long-term focus and a long-term view and understand your risk tolerance. And don't fixate on whether or not the market's at a high or the market's at a low. You'll never buy it at the low and very likely you'll be buying it at a high. But ultimately, if you stay invested in the stock market over time, you will do well.
<clears throat> I'm getting out. We'll sit tight and wait for a correction. <clears throat> this is, sounds so easy. It really does. The biggest question is, if the correction comes, when will you get back in? Statistics shows that you will get back in higher than where the market is today. If you play the scenario out in your mind, you can understand how this would happen. I had clients who got out of the market in 2008 when the Dow was 12,000. So it dropped from 14 and a half to 12 and maybe it was 11,000 at the time. And they said, I've had enough, I'm out. I'm gonna let this thing ride itself out. I'm gonna get in at a better price. I went back and tracked those clients and the average client went back into the market 20% higher from when they went out. Because the reason is in number three is that stocks are forward looking and news is backward looking, which means that data continues to get worse while the market is well into its recovery. In March of last year, the pandemic numbers were just starting. The severity of COVID was just becoming apparent and the market was already rising because the market was already looking past. They were looking at liquidity, they were looking at stimulus and they were looking at a vaccine even when it was inconceivable that there would be one. So if you wait till you feel better to get back into the market, you're going to get back in when you feel better. By the time you feel better, the market will have surpassed wherever you exited. So remember, the decision to sell is an easier decision than the decision to buy back in. I always use the analogy when I was a kid, I was very, very skinny and I was a lifeguard. And I knew that if I got out of the pool, I never got back in. As long as I stayed in the pool, I was there. Once I got back in, I was too cold. Once I got back out, I was too cold to go back in. The last point is also very powerful. We never know how long the correction is going to take. So even if we do have the discipline to go in at a lower price, you may not see that price or you may not have time to react. And people learned that the hard way back in March. Most of all, what will you do if the correction doesn't come? You will sit sometimes for years regretting your decision, but too stubborn to go back in because you'll be darned if you buy back into a market 30% higher than when you sold out. And you may very well stay off the train for a very long, if not infinite amount of time and thereby have disengaged yourself from one of the greatest creators of wealth, which is the market. Why would I pay $400 for one share of ABC when I can buy a dozen shares of XYZ? A man came over to me five or six years ago at a wedding. And like a doctor, people hound me for stock tips. And he says to me, Mark, I have some money. I don't want to buy the market. I want to buy one stock. What should I buy? I said, buy Amazon. He says, really? I said, yes, really. He says, but it's $580 a share. I said, so what? And he said, I can buy 10 shares of something else. Why would I buy one share of Amazon? I met the same man about six months ago at a wedding. I didn't remember him, but he remembered me. He came over to me and he said, five or six years ago, you gave me advice to buy Amazon stock. And we had the following conversation. And I said, great. And you bought it, right? He goes, no, I didn't. I said, why didn't you? He says, because I couldn't see myself paying $586 for one share of a stock. He says, so what should I do now? I said, well, if I tell you what to do now, you're probably not going to listen because Amazon at the time was 2,800. But I still believe that Amazon's a great company long-term and you should buy some. But I am certain that I'll meet him in five years from now Amazon will be $12,000 a share and he will have not have bought Amazon. And the answer is, is that stocks are not eggs and the price you pay for each makes no difference whatsoever. 
So I took a perfect example. Berkshire Hathaway's A shares trade at $350,000 a share and Apple trades at 135. Today, you can pick it up for 125. So look what's happened since I put this report together only a couple of weeks ago. Apple is 140% more expensive than Berkshire Hathaway. That's it, simply put. And if you don't understand why, it's simple. Berkshire Hathaway has fewer shares outstanding. So $350,000 buys you a much bigger piece of the pie. The price you're paying for Berkshire Hathaway um, earnings versus Apple's is a whole lot less. And therefore, the stock price tells you nothing at all. And how many shares you own in a company make no difference. It's the investment amount that you put in and the growth potential. And the last point is you have to always measure growth stocks, which tend to have sometimes inflated prices and inflated multiples by a different set of metrics than what you would apply to the market in general. Many people are loath to buy companies like Netflix or Apple before it split. Now it seems more attractive at 125, but at 500 or Amazon at 3000, it sounds ludicrous. But the answer is you cannot measure growth stocks by traditional metrics. And some of the greatest opportunities today in the market exist inside the growth sector. And you have to learn to retrain yourself. If you are a value thinker as I am, you have to focus on growth potential and not that much on what the current valuation of the company is, or you will never own some of the best performing stocks in the market. <clears throat> I am holding on to this stock until I break even. I've heard this from thousands of people when I look over their portfolios and I see a bunch of dogs. And I ask them, why are you still holding these stocks? And the answer is, I don't want to take a loss. And people have this notion that they didn't actually lose money until they sell. No, you lost money based on what the stock is worth today or you made money. You may not realize that gain or realize that loss, but the fact of the matter is that is what it's worth. And I always tell people to ask themselves the following simple question. If I didn't already own the stock, would I take cash and buy that stock right now? 90% of the time the people say, absolutely not. It's a terrible company. So if you're holding a terrible company, but you wouldn't buy a terrible company, what you're subject to is what's called risk for regret aversion, I'm sorry. Regret aversion means that the regret will take place when you sell it. And you will actually form, formalize that you took a loss and that you made a bad investment decision. And you'd rather one day be able to say, ha ha, I got my money back, than do what is prudent and responsible right now. So what I always tell people is sell. Capture the tax deduction because it's worth something. 30 days from now, so you don't run afoul of the wash sale rule, put it on your calendar to see if you're in the mood to buy it back. If you're not, you should never have been holding the stock to begin with. And the last point is really the way to think about it. If I had a dollar to spend today, what would I do with it? I have to be indifferent or agnostic to what I already own. Just because you own something is not a reason to continue to own it. If you wouldn't buy it today, unless there's a massive tax hit by selling it, which is another consideration, you should sell it. You should think about what is the best, what gives me the highest return prospects for my money right now. And if I had the cash, what would I purchase right now? And with those fresh set of eyes, you should continuously evaluate your portfolio. This stock was a great buy. It was 20% higher only a month ago. Well, first of all, stock prices go down for a reason. Sometimes that reason is panic. Sometimes that reason is unjustified. And that makes for a good opportunity. And I'm not saying 
that there aren't good opportunities when a stock falls 20%. But the fact that it fell 20% does not tell you automatically that there is an opportunity. Just as the market makes all-time highs on its ascent, a stock will make all-time lows on its descent. A stock that is 20% lower than it was needs to go 20% lower before it goes 40% lower and 60% lower and 80% lower. We call this in finance the value trap. It's sometimes you think you're buying a value stock and what you're really buying is a dying stock or a stock that was ridiculously overvalued and is now falling back to a fear value. I always ask people the question, if the stock is 20% lower and the market has priced it there, ask yourself what you know about this company that the market as a whole does not. Now, sometimes granted people are irrational and oftentimes the market becomes irrational and fear and the herd mentality drives people out of perfectly good stocks. But that's not always the case and you have to know what you're looking at. I always tell people to seek out information that both supports and counters whatever investment thesis you have. In other words, if you have conviction that this stock is 20% below what it should be, you have to justify that. And you have to justify that it isn't actually better priced at 40% lower. So what you'd wanna do is you would wanna seek out information. You'd wanna seek out contrarian views to whatever it is you believe, and then weigh that versus your bullish outlook and see which one rings more true for you. But until you introduce that contrarian information, you may be biased and you may make a very bad investment decision. Um, and the last is, is that sometimes you're better off with a winner than it's not as bad as people think loser. And there are many stocks in the market today that are mispriced to the downside. They are definitely trading at a discount to what they should be trading at. But everybody knows that, and there's no secret to that, yet they still continue to trade at that discount. Financials have traded at a substantial discount since 2008. They have traded at a multiple that is below the market. And people have thought that that is an absolute guarantee of outside returns, but it hasn't been. And the reason is, is that there's nothing attractive right now in this interest rate environment, which seems to be something that's gonna go on for a protracted period of time that should get people excited about banks. And if you bet on a more expensive part of the market for the last 15 years, your returns are, were astronomically greater than they were if you bought some of those not as bad as people think underperformers. So again, this comes back to value versus growth. And a person should have a perspective on both and they should have an allocation to both, but they certainly shouldn't fall in love with stacks just because they're underpriced. Because if you do that, you'll only be fishing in the value part of the market. This is what we call illusion of control. It is a very strong bias. Um, buy me a thousand shares is X, Y, Z because my nephew just became a CFO was just one example of it. If I had 80% of my portfolio in JP Morgan stock, that would be another example of it. In other words, when we think we have insider information, we have something that we know that makes us familiar with the company. We will be more aggressive and perhaps um, be more biased towards buying this stock. So the first thing I tell people is whenever you're going to make a decision to buy something, you have to differentiate to whether or not you're about to speculate or invest. I get a thousand questions a day about Bitcoin and I did several seminars for college kids 
And the deal was that nobody could ask me about GameStop until the last five minutes. And as soon as we got to the five minute mark, everybody only wanted to talk about GameStop. And I tell everybody the same thing. I am an investor. I am not a speculator. There is money to be made in speculation. There's a lot of money to be lost in speculation. You will make good money investing and it's extraordinarily unlikely that you will ever lose a big substantial sum of money as an investor. An investor takes a long-term view. An investor understands the fundamentals of what they're investing in. An investor understands things like cash flows and earnings and price and inflation and ingenuity and so on. They're investing in an enterprise that's driven by supply and demand, that's driven by gross domestic product. They understand what they're buying and that's the way Warren Buffett made his fortune and that's the way you will make yours. Speculating is simply buying something on the notion that you will be able to sell it at some point to somebody else at a higher price. There's no fundamental reason that that should happen other than the fact that people will want to buy it from you. It has no cash flow. It has no enterprise value. And it's simply a trade. So sometimes stocks leave the realm of investing and become speculations, such as GameStop. There is no fundamental underpinning to the valuation of GameStop. It's not like it has some incredible bright future ahead of it. And people who buy Tesla, on the other hand, can be, some people can look at them as speculators, but other people can say, no, they're actually very good investors because they see the future of, of electric vehicles. They see Elon Musk as a genius. They see the diversification that can potentially come from all the cash that Tesla is hoarding. And they see a company that is cornering a very big part of the market but also seems to have incredible ingenuity and a lot of smart people working for it. So I don't think too many people could have foreseen Google being what they are when they were just a search engine and went public, but those that did made astronomical sums of money. That's not speculating. That's betting on good talent. It's betting on ingenuity and it's betting on enterprise value. Bitcoin is a speculation. I'm not saying you can't make money on Bitcoin, but it's speculating. Buying a stock just because you think you know something, but not doing any more homework than that is simply speculating. Now, the problem with speculating is it's very difficult to have conviction. One of the keys to investing, I always say, is conviction, meaning you have such a conviction for this stock that if it, fall, if it fell and nothing fundamentally changed about the company, you will buy more. Warren Buffett once said that he would pay 25% of his wealth to see the stocks that he owns fall 50%. That sounds pretty illogical, but I'll explain what he meant. What he's saying is, imagine you know what a house is worth in your neighborhood. You've been living there all these years and you know exactly what it's worth. And if you saw a house in your neighborhood get sliced in half in its value, you would just jump in and buy it because you know that when things get back to normal, you can sell that house at a very hefty profit. You have conviction. You know what this thing is worth. Now you should be willing to pay some money for that to happen because you're gonna make a lot more when you're right. So Warren Buffett's thesis is, if he bought a company and he can buy it at 50% off, hey, he would do that. And that means he has conviction. The problem is when we speculate or when we buy something and don't know much about it, and then the trade goes against us and we're sitting here and wondering, why did we just make that purchase? Should I sell? Perhaps the company's really not what I thought it was. We end up selling. I met with somebody recently who um, shared with me their investment history. And at one point, it's painful to say this, but I will say it to you. 
He had 10,000 shares of Amazon. Um, take out your calculators and look at today's price and calculate 10,000 times today's price. And uh, you'll see a very big number. And he said to me that he owned the stock at $39 a share. And it fell to 35 and he sold it. That is a person who bought a stock without conviction. I bought Amazon stock personally nine times in the last seven years when I saw it dip from 1900 to 1600, from 2100 to 1900, from 2700 to 2200, because I knew that long-term this is a buying opportunity. So just because your nephew is a CFO or just because you work for a company doesn't necessarily mean that you have a very strong conviction for the company or for the stock. Um, Warren Buffett's expression that I put in here is a great one. If you're not willing to own a stock for 10 years, don't even think of owning it for 10 minutes. When you buy a company, you should be willing to lock it up in a drawer and forget that you own it. I want to tell you something that People were better stock investors in the days of stock certificates than they are today with online trading. You will recall buying a stock, getting a certificate in the mail and putting it into your drawer. It could have been Disney, could have been Johnson & Johnson, whatever it was. The selling mechanism was not there at your fingertips. You literally put these things away. And I know people who have stock for 30, 40, 50, 60 years and have done extraordinarily well simply because they bought it and they left it alone and forgot about it. So last, I did say this to the client at the time, she didn't listen. It wasn't the end of the world. Her nephew's stock has a show of support and solidarity, solidarity as though the CFO of the company really cares if his aunt owns the stock in her portfolio. Because people, people work for struggling companies, and that's never a reason to own a stock. Okay. This is the last one, and then we're going to open it up to questions. I can't see if there are questions, so somebody will read them to me. Cash. I hate cash. Um, I cash burns a hole in my pocket. I understand the sleep at night value of cash, but as Warren Buffett says, it is the very worst investment you can possibly have. Cash is king. Yes, it's king. Generally speaking, we never do anything with it and it just becomes worth less over time. Businesses go up. You own businesses, you're investing in the future. You own cash, you're sitting in the present, and you're losing value. My saying is, if I had my way, bank account statements would reflect purchasing power, which is real value, instead of dollar value, which is nominal value. In that world, people would be allergic to cash as I am. The problem with cash, as you all know, is inflation. And today, there's almost nothing you can do with your money to even hedge inflation other than go into a riskier part of the bond market or the equity markets, which is what's driving the markets right now. Um, that doesn't mean that you have all your money deployed in this kind of a market, but long term, your cash position should be a year to 18 months worth of emergency money. Beyond that, your money has to be working for you. So if you put a million dollars in the bank today and you earn a whopping 0.10, at the end of the year, you have $970,000 worth of purchasing power if you believe CPI numbers. Realistically, it's probably less than that. You wait another year and you're down to 940. A year later and you're down to 900. Now you look at your account statement and you feel really good about that because you have a million dollars, but you don't have a million dollars. You have $900,000, it's only been three years and you've lost 
$100,000 of purchasing power. If you saw that on your statement as my dream come true, it would spur you to do something with that money. But you don't. And we take comfort in the fact that the nominal value isn't fluctuating. We have to take risk. We have to take responsible risk in order to hedge inflation and hopefully even beat inflation. And therefore, you should develop an allergy to cash for an amount that is over and above. I want to tell you how far this goes. I have met countless people over my career that maintain lines of credit on their homes with balances, have substantial mortgages on their homes, and have cash hoards sitting in the bank. I see this all the time. To me, it's just mind boggling. And believe it or not, it's even difficult to talk these people out of this ridiculous strategy. This we call in finance, a negative arbitrage trade. Basically, I'm borrowing money at 3% and I'm owning cash that's paying me a 10th of a percent. When I can simply take that cash, pay off the line of credit, and if I ever need it again, I can simply write the check. But I don't do that. And I've met countless people who maintain balances or even a mortgage, a forced mortgage on their home when they have infinite amounts of cash sitting in the bank doing nothing for them. But they won't pay off that mortgage because they lack the comfort value of seeing all that cash sitting in the bank. And now this negative arbitrage on top of inflation, think about it, right? It's 3% for the mortgage. And then it's the inflation factor on the cash and you do the math and it makes absolutely no logical sense. But I've met so many people that continue to do that. And that is just simply irrational. And it's what it means to be human because the human beings like to have that cushion that helps them sleep at night. But if we can get over that and make more efficient use of our money, ultimately we will have more for ourselves, for our children, and even potentially for the Jewish National Fund. And now we will open it up to questions. <clears throat> Mark, thank you. Uh, very informative and always uh, great to hear your wisdom and hear you speak. We've got a few questions um, and people can continue to write questions into the chat if they have them and we'll get them answered. Uh, the first question is uh, tech stocks. They've done so well. Do you believe in sector rotations? Um, meaning is it time to look at those other areas of the market that have not done as well? So the answer is yes, I believe in sector rotations, but I don't make a big deal about them. Meaning I will not rotate out of my tech stocks just because the market is deciding that it's time for a rotation. Because even in a rotation, a lot of smart money stays in tech stocks or they would be going down 40, 50, 60%. But this is definitely a time to balance a tech sector weighting with a value sector weighting so that you sort of create a little bit of a seesaw. The difference between the value sector weighting and the tech stock weighting, for me at least, is that the value sector weighting is an opportunistic play, which will play itself out over a three to six month period and then peter out. And then I will wanna rotate that money out of that sector versus the tech sector weighting, which is a strategic part of my allocation and has been for the last 15 to 20 years. So I don't see a world where I will be underweight, even neutral weight technology because technology is the future. And you just look at the difference if you wanna highlight this between the S&P 500 and the MSCI EFA index, which is the large cap international index over the last 10 years. Historically, international stocks and US stocks performed similarly over time. But you've seen over the last 10 years, a great divergence one from the other. And people keep screaming and yelling about 
International stocks are cheap. It's time to buy them. And I don't buy it. And I'm underweight them for the last 10 years. Why is that? Because if you look at the top 10 holdings in the S&P, or you look at the top 50 holdings in the S&P, you will find the market leaders, the thought leaders in biotech, in, in fintech, in information technology, in e-commerce. Now run over to the international markets and see what you find over there. Banks and insurance companies and pharmaceuticals. Now these are good companies, but if I was going to bet on what the world looks like 20 years from now, it, in t my vision of that world is that technology is going to be a much bigger subset of the market than it is even today. And of course, technology is overpriced. Good luck waiting it for it to be underpriced to buy in. Buy it and hold it. Because 30, 20 years from now, these are going to be the market leaders. And when you own the index, you'll be buying into all of the newcomers as they move their way up into the index. So if you bought um, the S&P 10 years ago and you looked at the top 10 holdings, they would look at all like they look today. Almost none of the top 10 holdings were even there, period. They weren't even in the S&P, let alone the top 10 holdings. And now you look at these companies. You probably never heard of NVIDIA 10 years ago, but it's a market leader. Am I worried that the stock is going down now? Not at all. I bought more because chips and the, the, the markets that they dominate 20 years from now, it's hard to imagine that this isn't going to be a market leader of a company. So... Yes, rotations take place. Those are opportunistic. They're short-lived. When the value cycle plays itself out, you want to go more neutral into S&P again. But I would, although I'm not supposed to make investment um, directives on this call because JP Morgan will have me in handcuffs, I can just tell you for myself, an overweight to technology is a permanent part of my allocation. Thank you. Um, quite another question. Um, is Mark in favor of individual investing purchase, individual investors purchasing individual stocks or index funds? So the answer is for the most part, index funds. Because going back to what we said before, it's very, very difficult to have conviction for individual stocks unless you really understand the companies. And when you buy an individual stock, you're subjecting yourself to potentially higher volatility, which can get you to make big mistakes. However, and Matt knows this as well as I do, if you have a company that you fundamentally believe in, you know that this is a company that you were willing to put in your drawer, take a stock certificate, lock it up, and give somebody the key, there's no reason why you shouldn't own it or own some of it. So as a rule, what I would suggest is you have about 80% of your stock allocation to broad-based indexes, and you have 10 to 20% in individual names that you have very high conviction for. Because the other value is that it's fun. It's interesting. It's not fun to own the S&P, but it's interesting to own Apple or Peloton Whatever it is, I own Etsy. I love this company. I think it's just going to do unbelievable. I own Shopify. Some of these companies that I have strong conviction for, and they don't get flustered if they fluctuate against me, I find it fun because I'm into them. The problem with owning Amazon for me is I keep buying stuff on Amazon and thinking that it's going to help my stock price. My wife keeps telling me, why do you keep buying stuff on Amazon? I go, don't you understand? Every time I buy an Amazon, I'm getting back some of that in my stock price. Isn't that ridiculous? But the truth of the matter is that I, I believe in the company. I can connect to what they're doing. And I think that they are unbelievable. And I feel good about owning a part of it. So I think 80-20 is a reasonable rule. 
Thank you. Um, do you differentiate between international markets and emerging markets? Um, yes, for sure. Um, emerging markets is a better place today than the international markets because you are getting more growth. And believe it or not, in a lot of cases, more ingenuity. Um, the problem with emerging markets is they're emerging. So as a percentage of your equities, they should never be more than 5%. Um, but they are a high growth sector of the market, but they do come with a lot of risk. And that's why you weight them appropriately. All right, thank you. We're going to take two more. Um, if you have any questions, you can send them to us and then we will uh, be able to get the answers from Mark. Uh, Mark, it sounds like you are a strong supporter of long-term investing in equities. What are your feelings on formula portfolio, formula type portfolio strategies, X percent in equities, uh, Y percent in bonds, et cetera? So diversification in bonds is sometimes necessary. Um, and I'll tell you where and how it's necessary. Um, and it's Horrible as bond yields are today, and as mispriced as the bond market is, for many investors, it's a necessary evil. One, if you're spending off the portfolio, you cannot afford the full drawdown of the market, and therefore, you have to have some bond diversification. And mathematically, it's simple. If you're 100% in the stock market, and you're pulling 5% a year, and we experience a 2008 where the market draws down 52%. So over an 18 month period, the market lost 52%. And if your timing of your cash flows were unfortunately not great, year one, you pulled out 5%, year two, you pulled out 7.5% because you don't think about it as a percentage, you think about it as how much money you need. And since your portfolio went down 50%, and you took the same amount, the math tells me you took out 7.5%. So now you have taken out 12.5% on top of the fact that the market has dropped 52%. So you add that together and you have a cool 67% drawdown. And if you continue to spend as the market goes back up, which you're going to need to do to fund yourself, you will never crawl out of that hole no matter what. So that is a catastrophic potentiality for somebody who's spending off their portfolio, which must be avoided at all costs, which means that even if we have to build a portfolio that is suboptimal in terms of its annualized return potential, we have to mitigate that swing or that volatility factor, and we must own bonds. And a good financial advisor will be able to creatively create a portfolio that mitigates enough of that potential drawdown, yet doesn't take away a large percentage of the potential upside. That's one. Two, some people just cannot tolerate the full drawdown of the market. They know themselves or their financial advisors know them well enough to know that even though this is long-term money and even though they're not spending off this money. If they were ever to see a 30% drawdown, they would capitulate. I'll give you a real story. <clears throat> I was pitching a family that had sold a business for $300 million. My competition was recommending a very equity weighted allocation. I was recommending a bond weighted allocation. And the reason was is that they had never had substantial wealth until this liquidity event. And the competition was talking in percentages. What could potentially happen in let's say a 75-25 allocation? And 20%, 25%. And they said, that sounds reasonable. <clears throat> and I realized that I was about to lose this piece of business because I was coming in with a almost a flipped allocation, 25 or 30% in equity, very bond weighted. And my goal was to get them to a good equity weighting over time, but first familiarize with them with the stock market. But my return potential was much lower. It was almost half of my competition. 
So I did the following. It was a little bit insane, but it worked. I created fictitious um, financial um, statements from JP Morgan. I basically made up a mock set of, um, what do you call it? Monthly statements. And it started with, let's say $300 million. And I said, here's month one statement. And they looked at it. And then I showed the month two statement and it was $287 million. And their reaction was, oh my God, what happened? And that was just a blip. These are people who were willing to sign up for 25% volatility. But when they lost three or 4% in a month, they, I, I can see it on their face. I took them through three or four months of account statements. And let me tell you something, when they got to eight or 9%, they said, stop. That's as far as we would ever go. So they said to the other firm, 20% sounds reasonable. But when they actually lived it, even in, in uh, just the role play, they realized that it could never happen. They couldn't tolerate it. So a person has to be realistic about their risk tolerance. And if you don't have a risk tolerance for 30 40% drawdown, you are going to have to own bonds because the worst thing you can do is capitulate. It's better to stay invested long-term in a 50-50 than try to be a smart aleck and capitulate with a 75-25 or 80-20 allocation. So I always say, sometimes bonds are the cost we pay to be able to have the stamina to own our stocks. And that's why these types of balanced allocations oftentimes make sense even for long-term money that we're not spending on. Mark, thank you very much. We're gonna, I'm gonna hand it over back to Matt Bernstein. Uh, but before we do, if you have any other further questions, uh, feel free to reach out uh, to the planned giving team at Jewish National Fund, and we will be happy to get the questions to Mark. Matt? So I wanna say, uh, Mark, as usual, thank you very much for a terrific session. I just wanna relay a story to everyone. I think it relates to what you've been talking about. It'll take two seconds. Years ago, I attended a program that uh, Mark did on this very same subject. And I don't remember all the particulars. I just remember the, um, what this was about. He handed out a uh, information from a company that tracks certain uh, be uh, behaviors of investors. And it showed a mutual fund where the manager had been the leading mutual fund manager for a period, I think, of six or seven years. The fund itself, from that time to the time that they did the study, did fabulously, but this average investor lost. Lost money. And lost money. And you say, well, how could that be? Because they were buying and selling at the wrong times. So here's a, a man, a, a manager that had a fabulous uh, track record for six years, I think it was, and the average investor lost money. It goes to what we're what he was saying about long term and everything else. So I want to thank Mark. Next week uh, we have a really terrific program on real estate trends, um, certainly um, post COVID and what's going on now by some experts uh, out of uh, Chicago who have a national presence in real estate. And if you don't mind, if you're interested in fixed income or you're interested in earning some income and you're interested in supporting the Jewish National Fund at the same time, give us a call. Our char charitable gift annuity program is uh, doing real well, paying very competitive rates of income. Mark is the lead manager on the gift annuity pool. So give us a call. We'll be happy to uh, give you all the information. So thanks for coming, and um, we'll see you next week, same channel, same time, and we'll talk about um, real estate trends, which I think will be important. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day.